Kia ora, and welcome to Playmakers, where this week our guest is someone who had a very special career with North Harbour, with the Highlanders, with the Blues, the All Blacks, before going on to phenomenal success with the famous London club Harlequins, where he's now part of the coaching staff. We're talking about Nick Evans. Nick, uh, welcome and thanks for joining us and uh, great to see you. You too, TJ. You're looking well, mate. <laughs> well, it's a good time to be talking to you because Harlequins have just made the top four of the English Premiership for the first time. I think it was at eight or nine years. You did it with a very good win over Bath at the weekend and you did it in front of a crowd. So that must have been a special day. It was, TJ. Um, I think firstly, just to have the crowd back, um, you know, we've, we're, well, we're still in lockdown um, or some sort of lockdown. Um, and to, to have the crowd back for the first time in, in 16 months was uh, was fantastic for us. Had 4,000, but it, it sounded like 40,000. So, yeah, look, we're, we're going really well. We're, um, we've kind of had a change of coach uh, or head coach, um, you know, probably about, what was it, two or three months ago. So, you know, we've kind of tapped back into the DNA of the club um, and we've got a really kind of good environment going at the moment. And, um, yeah, made the, made the top four since the last time, seven years ago, when I, when I was playing. So, yeah, fantastic opportunity for us. As I say, you're the attack coach of this team and you're scoring at about 31 points a game for the season. So uh, y you're going well. I mean, what, what's the key to scoring all these points? Yeah, look, I think, um, again, as I said before, we, we've tapped back into the DNA of the club. The, one of the reasons I came over back in 2008 was because it was an ambitious group of young kids that were playing you know, probably an unconventional style to what English rugby purists would think it would be, you know, the 10-man game. So we've kind of tapped back into that. We're a London club. We, we kind of have a heart that, uh, that, that's at the stoop and in Twickenham. Um, and we're known for our ancestors for the, the, around Twickenham. And, and the club at Harlequins is, is about playing open-style rugby and, and passing the ball and, and offloading and playing a high-tempo game. So we've, we've definitely tapped back into that. And um, we've got a great group of young kids, obviously Danny Kerr playing well, young Marcus Smith, uh, for those down there, keep an eye out for him. He's, he's, he's in the next thing coming out of England in terms of their fly half. So, yeah, we're, we're playing some good stuff and, and we're here to entertain, which is great. You had phenomenal success at Harlequins as a player. You scored a record number of points. You won a premiership with them. I think you and uh, Jason Leonard were uh, given the status of the Hall of Fame at the, at the same time. And he's a real legend of the game. So what is it uh, about Harlequins that has made it such a great fit for you? Um, I think I, when, I, when I first came over, um, it, was a, it was a massive decision, you know, obviously to, to leave the All Blacks and leave New Zealand. I think, you know, I did a lot of thinking about what club would suit me and not, and not go for, for the money or, or, or anything like that. And, to, you know, as many people probably think most people would probably go up there to do, um, you know, it's certainly part of it. But look, I think it was sold to me as a young, ambitious club. Uh, with a group of, of, of young players that were coming through that look that were looking to to really build on the game this expensive game and it, and it really kind of suited me and, it, and to be honest mate it was just an opportunity that came at the right time for me um, you know I, I probably needed a change um, I was 28 uh, and I, I think as I said the kind of stars aligned a little bit so you know I went over there and and actually the best thing that happened to me was um, was I did my MCL in the first game. And um, I had about six weeks, I was sitting on the sideline and it gave me an opportunity just to sit and watch and, and see how the club operated and what they needed. And, and it, I kind of worked out what they needed was me to be exactly what the club needed to be and not, not me to try and change things and, and make it like a super rugby side or, or like the All Black side. So the catalyst was Danny Kerr. He set the tempo for everything we did. So I, my job was just to make sure everything was organised around him. And then we just play off the back of what, what he saw and, and the momentum that, that, that we created. So I think... Um, that, that kind of really suited the way I wanted to play. And obviously, you know, being a 10, the, the, the spaces started opening up for me and then I could start dictating things a little bit more. So, yeah, it just ended up being a perfect fit. You kind of broke the mould with your timing a bit. I think you and Carl Heyman, uh, he was in a, a similar boat. Post the 2007 World Cup, you still had a lot of great rugby ahead of you, whereas a lot of New Zealanders had been seeking to go over perhaps more towards the end uh, of, of their careers. I mean, did you ever sort of sit back, say, for example, when uh, New Zealand won the World Cup in 2011, thinking, oh, God, you know, it would have been nice to be part of that? Or, or you know, ha have you had no regrets about your move? I've had... Uh, it's easy to say now, mate, that I've had no regrets. Um, obviously, it was... When I, when I first went over, there was a... a you know, that you kind of look back and you're like, well, I haven't made the right decision. And obviously, you know, for those that probably don't know, obviously Bloodgate happened in my first 
year over there. So, you know, that was quite a big, <laughs> a big thing to go through. I stuck at it. Um, we won a trophy. And then obviously watching in 2011 as the teams were going down, I was just thinking, you've got to be kidding me. This is ridiculous. Um, and But then obviously the year after we won the premiership. So I think that kind of really vindicated my decision to leave. And, and one of the main reasons for coming, for coming over to, to Harlequins was to help them win trophies. But I'm not going to lie, mate, when... Um, you know, when Carter was going down and Perry went down and I think Cruden went down, I was just sitting there going, this is, this is, this is just one of those things. But um, yeah, no, it, uh, I, I've got no regrets at all. I think the first time I remember seeing you play was he, he was this young fella come out of Westlake Boys, but you'd actually had an opportunity to go and play AFL. I mean, how realistic was that proposition as, as a young man? Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty big, I think. Um, it was one of these things. We had an Australian teacher at Westlake Boys, and um, he was he was kind of pushing the amateur side of it. You know, give, telling us a couple of uh, a couple of me and my mates that there was an amateur kind of club system in in, um, in and around Auckland and on the North Shore, and there was a Takapuna side. So he was like saying, "Well, you guys want to come down?" And um, you know, I'd, I'd played a bit of cricket in the summer, and it was kind of well, it was an opportunity to keep the fitness up and then kind of improve the kicking. So we went down, and, and I remember turning up to training. And, you know, we were young 17, 18-year-olds and, um, you know, it was all these sparkies and, and uh, panel beaters and they're all smoking on the field and, you know, having some having the cigarettes before uh, <laughs> before uh, training and, and, and before games and things like this. And, we, and so basically we were just given the role of like, just you guys run around and you just kick the ball to us and we'll kick the goals. And we're like, all right, sweet. That sounds pretty good to us. So it kind of just stemmed from there. So we really enjoyed it and kept playing and there was all the – led to an under New Zealand under 21 side and we, we traveled to Australia and then there was a New Zealand men's side and, and we traveled and went over there as well. And a couple of us got invited to go over and train with the under 18s. And it was, it was brilliant. I, I mean, I absolutely love the game just in terms of like fitness, but also improving my kicking. It definitely improved my accuracy and, and put another 10, 15 yards um, onto my kick. So it was something that, that, that I really enjoyed. And, um, and then there was just an opportunity that, that came up to, to go and trial for the, Sydney um, second side um, and yeah I, I, was, I was thinking about it um, but obviously rugby was starting to take off I was trying to I was trying to do physiotherapy at uni as well so I was studying that as well and I was like do I just sack it all in and go go to AFL or, or try my hand at AFL or do I do I stick at this rugby and, and, and get my degree done so um, I think obviously you know history tells the story that I, that I stayed and stuck rugby out but it was, yeah, it was definitely another decision that I had to make. But, yeah, it was, it was a fantastic game and still love watching it now. And then, of course, the decision to go to the Highlanders. Um, and again, a team that just seemed to be the right fit, the whole Dunedin thing, I guess, seemed, seemed to suit you and bring the best out of you. Yeah, I loved it. Uh, absolutely loved my time in Dunedin. Um, the people, the, the the city, the town, the countryside. Um, yeah, just just really kind of connected to me. Um, and the decision to go there really was was kind of an easy one. Obviously, the the I think the year in two thousand and four, the the Blues didn't select me um, as part of their wider group, which is fine. And then and then I got picked up as a wild card uh, to go down there. And um, and then and then there was just obviously a bit of a long term plan in terms of Tony Brown. Uh, ending and, and then someone taking over and, and then that was going to be that was going to be me so there was a, definitely a pathway there for me so obviously going down as a fullback first uh, for my first year and then, and then moving into to take Brownie's spot um, which was a was a fantastic honour as well so yeah the, the the whole place and and man, man, man we had some fun I mean I think after every game was a court session and you go out and the, you know the, the students all around all the student bars and, and you know as a single follow it was it was, uh, it was it was brilliant you know so. Yeah, I, I absolutely love the people, love the town, um, and and watch all the games as much as I can. And quite fittingly, you got to make your test debut for the All Blacks when you came off the bench against England at Carisbrook. And that was a, a, a pretty amazing time, a transitional time in New Zealand rugby, because obviously uh, post-2003, Graham Henry had come in, and, and against the team that had won the World Cup, the All Blacks just exploded against them that year. What were your memories of that occasion? Oh, dream come true, TJ. I think like anyone who gets to put the All Blacks jersey on, um, you know, a couple of real fond memories for that. Obviously, being in an All Black trial, um, you know, uh, playing up there in Auckland and, and being in an All Black trial, and then the way we got selected, we're all in a big, big room. I think it was about sixty or oh, no, not sixty, probably about forty of us in there, and then guys would go out and come back in, and then some guys would go out and not come back in, and and then the, the group was getting smaller and smaller, and then then obviously the coaches came in and said you know, this is, you guys are the All Blacks now and um, you guys have selected and 
wow, I just couldn't believe it. And to get my first jersey from Sir Brian Lahore, that's right, you know, that was just unbelievable to to get that. And I remember putting it on my bed at the hotel in Dunedin and just kind of staring at it. And um, yeah, and then to run out at my home ground at that time in, at Carisbrook and hearing the roar was was fantastic. And then obviously to beat the beat the reigning World Cup um, champions in England as well. So yeah, it was a fantastic kind of whirlwind month um, that I'll never forget. Because you went on to play 16 test matches for the All Blacks. Uh, the end came at Cardiff. And I remember you, you came <laughs> yeah. off the bench, you made this amazing break. And then, like everyone else in the team, succumbed to a muscle injury. There was a fair bit of that going on. Um, the response to what happened after that, was, was that a factor in, in you deciding to leave New Zealand? Because I think it certainly was with Carl Heyman. Yeah, I mean... I don't, I don't think it was a factor at that time, mate. I think um, obviously hugely disappointing, um, you know, to, to, to let the country down like that. that that's kind of how we felt. Um, but the outpouring of support was unbelievable. I remember it at the time, you know, even being up there from the French fans and from the Welsh fans being in Cardiff. But even when we got back as well was, was something that I'll never forget in terms of just the country getting around us. Um, but we were, we were bitterly disappointed. So I don't think that was a, a massive factor. I think it obviously came into it, obviously, after I played the season with the Blues and kind of when you look back on your career and you're looking to go overseas, you, you go, well, have you been to a World Cup? Yes, I've tick, tick, kind of ticked that box. And having been a little bit older than maybe some of the, the, the players coming through, I, I guess that kind of probably more lent to the opportunity. And as I said before, when it aligned to a club that suited the way I, I wanted to play and and really gave me the responsibility of playing a lot of games and leading this young young club through um, at Harlequins. I think that kind of really kind of put the nail in the coffin in terms of make, uh, me making the decision. So, yeah, I wouldn't say the World Cup was a massive part of it, but obviously it was like one of those things that I've managed to tick off and, um, and be a part of. Yeah, because you came back and before you left, you played that one season for the Blues in 2008, but they, they didn't pick you for the All Blacks. Did you feel that they, they did that because you'd signalled your intentions? Um, maybe, maybe I, th I, I think, maybe I think so. I think I've actually come to come back a few times to New Zealand. And I spent a bit of professional development with Wayne Smith. I had a couple of days with him um, down in the Waikato and um, down in Hamilton. And I was just like a little kid at the first day of school, just soaking in this these pearls of wisdom. Um, it was unbelievable. But yeah, we, and we talk, we spoke about it because I remember him coming up in two thousand and nine. Um, you know, asking would I come back. Um, you know, they, they were trying to get me back again. And, um, you know, I said, oh, look, you know, I've, I've kind of made my bed and I want to come here and stick it out and, and, and see if I can help this club win trophies. So I think, yeah, if I, if I look back at it, then not, not getting selected that year was, was, was maybe another reason why, look, there, there may be to move on, but I'd already signed by then. So yeah. I, I think, you know, it, that was probably their decision and, and totally accept that, you know, it, I'd made my decision, they made theirs and, and, and we moved on. You mentioned Smithy there. I mean, one of the great thinkers of the game, one of the great people of the game. I mean, how big an influence was he on the way you played and uh, had gone on into coaching? And are there other people that you've kind of formulated your style of coaching from? Yeah, I think I think coaching definitely. I think, as you say, he's an unbelievable thinker of the game and, um, you know, the, they call it the guru uh, about how he sees things that, that, that most people either don't. But I think the one big thing that I picked up from him that I use in my coaching and really kind of formulated around was, was how he coaches through relationships. Um, you know, he knew, he, he knew everything about everyone um, and he had a special bond with every single player. And it, it might've been about their family. It might've been about, you know, how, what, what they do outside of rugby. It might be, um, you know, the kids that they have, it might be how they're interested in rugby and how, and how he gets the best out of them. So, you know, for me, it was always the conversation about rugby always started with something that, 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 that allowed you to have the relationship with him. Uh, and then it allowed him to, to give the feedback, whether it was positive or give that performance feedback, which is obviously critical in terms of getting the best out of players. So it's definitely something that, I, that I've, I've molded a lot of my, my kind of coaching on is that coaching through relationships. And um, yeah, he, he was, he's a big influence in that. Mm. So what sort of coach are you? Uh, do you get animated or you try and stay calm? What, what's the style? Um, well, I don't, I don't know. I, I think I'm definitely more kind of on the, on the calm side. I think, you know, we all do these kind of character psycho reference things that, that give you all these cut type of colours that you are. And probably I'm very apt that I'm wearing blue because I'm, I'm, I'm that kind of person. So I'm more on the analytical side of things. Uh, you know, take my time and think about it um, rather than this kind of red head and, and go straight for it and, and, and give, 
give the yelling and screaming. I've got Jerry Flannery, um, the ex-Irish hooker. He's our uh, line-out and defence coach, and um, we're, we're polar opposites. So, you know, we, we actually have to sit next to each other in the coach's box because we kind of even even out the coaching box a little bit. <laughs> we put him and Adam Jones together. The two of them just go off, and next thing you know, everyone, everyone will be subbed off the field because they make a mistake. And uh, But at times, you know, you kind of need that kind of, you know, the, the feedback needs to be given straight away. So I'm more kind of the, the sit back and relax, maybe not relax, but but think about things a little bit more and, and, and take a bit of time to make my decisions. So, but we're all different. Um, and it's, it, I think there's no perfect way. It's just how, how you're comfortable in yourself and be true to yourself. And, 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 and I think if the players kind of feel that from you, then, um, then you're on a good start. Where do you see your coaching Future. I mean, are you committed perhaps to, to a coaching career in the UK or have you considered the possibility at some stage? I know you've got a young family, uh, but of coming back to New Zealand, would, would, is that something that you're thinking about? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's definitely something that, that we're thinking about. I think we've been here, I remember when I first signed, I thought I was only going to be here for three years. And um, I think this is our 14th year coming up. So I think it's, it's hard to say for sure what can happen in, in rugby. It's a very fickle business. And obviously when you want to, when, when you want to move and have jobs, people have to lose jobs for you to get jobs. So it, it, it can be quite tough. So I, I think for us as a family, we definitely want to come back to New Zealand one day and I would love to give back to New Zealand rugby. That's, that's one of my aims. I think New Zealand rugby gave me the opportunity to, to have a amazing career as a player, give me the opportunities that I've got for my family and, and myself. So I want to give back and, and help, help young kids in New Zealand, um, at, uh, down the later date, experience what I've experienced. Uh, my job at the moment now is to, is to give the opportunities for, for young English kids uh, at Harlequins to experience opportunities that, that I experienced in a white jersey. You know, I've got Marcus Smith there. My my goal is to make him um, a test player, uh, and, that, and that, that's what I'm trying to do. So, yeah. So uh, look, I'm committed here for the for the moment. We're doing really well. I want to make sure that that, that we win trophies because that's what we're in the business of doing. Uh, and then, yeah, definitely, I want to make sure. That, 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 that hopefully I can come back and, and give back to New Zealand rugby because um, they gave me so much and I'd love to give back and help help these young kids get through to what they want to get to. Give us a snapshot of what life is like. You've got a young family, I think uh, quite a, a range of ages, three kids, um, you, and you're living mm -hmm. out in, in Surrey. Just tell us, you know, a snapshot of, of your, your daily life. In terms of like kind of a normal day-to-day -day week, I won't through, go through the granular aspects of it, but, you know, it's, it's a long season. Um, you know, if I go through the lockdown, we, we did two thirds of the season. We stopped. We then put the last third into nine weeks. So we played midweek. We had two weeks off season. We then had three weeks preseason and we're straight back into a, a full calendar year of, of, of playing the next season. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a big marathon of a season up here. We, we generally go for, you know, anywhere from 42 to 48 weeks of the year with, with little sporadic kind of week, weeks off in between. So it can be it can be a bit of a grind, um, but then that that that's that's what you're in for, and that's that allows you to be adaptable and come up with with ways to bring energy and and, and find different ways to to, to get these guys motiv well not motivated but 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 engaged in, in what you're trying to do. So I think we, we really love it out here. Surrey is a lovely place. Um, you know, it's 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 the lovely green parks, and and the kids have a great time. They go to, go to some amazing schools. Um, you know, the coast is not too far away. Um, you know, it's about 45 minutes to an hour away if you want to go get some water. But um, yeah, so we're, so we're really enjoying it at the moment. Um, we do miss we do miss New Zealand. We just miss the accessibility of the ocean. You know, we'll, I was a big sailor with my with my dad being a big sailor. So I, I do miss fishing. I do miss fishing a lot. Um, but um, but yeah, it, it is very nice up here. What's gone over the last year has given us an opportunity to, to go back into the vaults and, and bring out some classic matches from the past. And uh, this week we're going to be showing a game that you were involved in and back in 2005 where the Highlanders went to Wellington and had a really good win over the Hurricanes. You got any memories of that game in particular? Yeah, I think um, it, it's funny. You, know, you kind of, I think as rugby players, you kind of have teams that kind of suit your style. And I think up here when I played for Quinns, it was Gloucester for some reason, just kind of suited the way I played and always had good games. And I think when I played for the Highlanders, the Hurricanes were a team that suited the way I played, whether it was fullback in my first year or, or then moving into the number 10 uh, spot. I think the one just to play against the likes of, you know, the guys like Rodney, Soalo, Jerry Collins, Tana, um, Ma Nonu, one that just gets you up. 
uh, but two, the, the way both teams played, it was generally a pretty open game, and um, you know, we had some epic battles. So um, I remember playing. I remember that game. I think I think I ended it with one of my very rare drop goals. It didn't take many drop goals. Um, I definitely didn't take one in two thousand seven when I probably should have. But um, <laughs> yeah, I definitely uh, I definitely hit one hit one in that game that was pretty good. So I, I just remember it being a great game, and um, um, yeah, it was a fantastic. It was fantastic to play against the Hurricanes at the Caketon. I love playing there. Okay, well, look, we'll, we'll show that game um, and we'll enjoy seeing you in action for the Highlanders. Let's get back to the present now uh, and what lies ahead because you've made the top four. I think there's one more round to go in the Premiership before you get into the playoffs. You know, Can you go all the way, do you think, at Harlequins? Look, we've, we've given ourselves an opportunity. Um, we've got actually got two, two rounds to go. We've got Sale this weekend and then we've got Newcastle the weekend after. Um, it looks like we're probably going to line up to play Pat Lamb's Bristol. Uh, in the semi-finals, which means a trip down to Ashton Gate in, in Bristol. So they're, they're, they're a good team, a good side. So look, uh, I think you know, mate, you've seen a lot of semi-finals. Yeah. I, I, anything can happen. Um, we'll, we'll prepare well. Obviously, we need to make sure we don't concede as many points as, as, as we are at the moment. Um, and we're working on that over the next couple of weeks to, to improve a few areas of that. But yeah, look, we'll, we'll give it a go. And we'll most importantly be true to ourselves and be true to the fact that when Quinns fans look at us, they can go, yep, that's our team. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to a good couple of weeks of, of work and then, and then get stuck into a semi. And of course, you've got the opportunity uh, to go into the European uh, competition again, which is such a, a huge thing. We, it was very disrupted uh, this last season. Uh, it got kind of weird for a while and you ended up with an all-France final. Is that indicative of where the strength is at the moment? Is that the power base in Europe, France? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think um, you just have to look at the two teams, La Rochelle, and uh, and to lose in the final, um, their, their kind of player base, that, that, that especially just at those clubs, obviously, Jono uh, doing a fantastic job there at La Rochelle. Um, I think what, what's changed a lot now is just the alignment through French rugby from, um, you know, uh, underage groups up through to the senior squad now. I think there's a, there's a massive alignment in terms of the pathway to the top. And I think you're seeing the under 20s, you know, some of those group of the, the the strong under 20 side that the French had in the last couple of years coming through and making a real impact. In terms of the club rugby, um, I think you're seeing not as many maybe foreigners going over. There's a lot of young French guys. You just look at Intermac, um, you know, Charlie Bear in, in terms of the 10 positions, but a lot of these young young flankers coming through, young props coming through. So I think there's a, there's a real alignment in French rugby at the moment. Um, and there's a bit of I don't know. There's a bit of mongrel about them as well. I think whether that's come from, um, you know, the top side uh, in terms of the like kind of the, the way they defend now. I think that's kind of filtered through. So you know, they're 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 not the the rollover, especially when they travel as they once were. Um, you know, they're, they're a hard side to play against, and that that's kind of filtering down through to club level as well. So it's great for it's great for European rugby because it's the pinnacle and it's a fantastic competition to be to be a part of, and everyone wants to be in it. Um, because you know you, you you do well in that and opens opens the window for everything. So um, yeah, looking forward to being part of that again next season. Just looking at the, you know the financial side of it, of course, um, the money that's been offered to New Zealand players over the years it has been absolutely massive. Is there a shift there, perhaps away from uh, a quantity and just really targeting a, a elite players with with really big sums of money that it's going to be hard for them to turn down? I think in England, definitely, TJ, I think we've, we've got a 20% decrease in the salary cap uh, next season. Um, and obviously with what's COVID, once COVID has done to all the clubs up here in terms of, you know, really kind of destroying a lot of their income for a year, I think a lot of the clubs are struggling a little bit. We're allowed uh, two marquee players at the moment. That's been dropped down to one. So I think naturally we the quality is going to be over the quantity in terms of the 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 type of players that we get. You know that we're going to look we're going to look for specifically you know to to, to pay money to 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 one or you know two no more than that. You know real quality players from the south. I think French are a little bit different. They they operate on a little bit more or well, a lot more in terms of salary cap than than, than we do in terms of English um, and the and the Welsh and the Pro 14. So, you know, they can probably look to target a, a few more. But again, as I said before, the alignment in French rugby at the moment, I think there's a big shift towards not having as many foreigners and, and again, looking at foreigners that are going to really complement them rather than just fill them up with the names. So, yeah, I think, I think you're going to see a big shift 
yeah. um, in the near, well, in the next couple of years, definitely down that road. Yeah, interesting times, isn't it? Well, mate, it's been absolutely fascinating uh, catching up with you. Uh, you've got a lot to look forward to, and we'll be following with great interest how Harlequins go between now and the end of the season, and of course, uh, when you, you get back into Europe next year. Nick Evans, thank you so much for joining us on Playmakers, and uh, all the best. Hope to see you soon. Absolute pleasure, TJ, and it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, bud. Great to see you. And we hope you enjoyed that interview with Nick Evans on Playmakers. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm Tony Johnson. Matewa, tofa soi for. Thank you.